A jury brought in its verdict today on the man called the Dapper Don. I'll say with respect to defendant John Gotti, we find him not guilty. We delve into the captivating life of John Gotti, the infamous mob boss of the Gambino crime family. Known as the Teflon Don, Gotti rose to power through a web of violence, power, and controversy. From his humble beginnings in the Bronx to his reign as the head of one of the most feared criminal organizations in New York City, Gotti's story is one of audacity, cunning, and ruthlessness. Brace yourself for a tale that will shock and captivate you as we uncover the secrets and sensational facts behind a day in the life of John Gotti. Young Gotti. In the heart of the South Bronx, a legend was born, John Joseph Gotti Jr., a name that would soon strike fear into the hearts of many. But before he became the infamous Teflon Don, Gotti's early life was shaped by poverty, tragedy, and a burning desire for something more. John Gotti was born on October 27, 1940, the fifth child of John J. Gotti Sr. and Fanny Gotti. Their family grew to 11 children, seven boys, and four girls, but their humble beginnings were marred by the harsh realities of life. Due to poor medical care, some of his siblings died during childhood. The Gotti family lived in a dirt-poor, poverty-ridden section of the South Bronx. They struggled to make ends meet, with little access to proper medical care. Tragically, some of Gotti's siblings lost their lives during their early years. Gotti's father, described as a hard-working immigrant from the Neapolitan section of Italy, provided for the family. However, Gotti himself would later claim that his father never worked a day in his life. While Gotti's description of his father may have been exaggerated, there's no denying the hardships the family faced. But despite their struggles, they managed to save enough money for a fresh start. When Gotti was 10 years old, his father made a life-changing decision. He moved the family to the Sheep's Head Bay neighborhood of Brooklyn, leaving behind the cramped quarters of the South Bronx. A year later, the Gotti family relocated once again, this time to East New York. It was in these tough neighborhoods that young Johnny Boy Gotti learned to use his fists and developed a burning anger toward those who had a better life. Instead of aspiring to become a businessman or doctor, Gotti's goal was to be one of the wise guys he saw on a daily basis. He was drawn to their power, their influence, and their ability to control their own destinies. By the age of 12, alongside his brothers Peter and Richard, Gotti became part of a gang that ran errands for the local mobsters. This street education consumed his time, leaving little room for a formal education. Gotti's teachers considered him a disturbing distraction in the classroom. His quick temper and bullying behavior made him a routine discipline problem. Education took a back seat to the allure of the streets. Gotti's education suffered as he became more involved in street activities. He was a habitual truant and a class bully, causing his teachers to view him as a disturbing distraction. His absence from school was of little concern to them, as they saw him as a routine discipline problem. But fate had other plans for Gotti. In 1954, a robbery gone wrong left him injured and hospitalized. The incident would leave him with a permanent reminder of his early life on the streets. After spending most of his 14th summer in the hospital, Gotti emerged with a new gait, a physical reminder of the dangers he faced and the path he had chosen. The streets became Gotti Gotti's classroom, where he learned the ways of the underworld. He quickly gained a reputation for his quick fists and his willingness to stand up to anyone who crossed him. And so, the stage was set for the rise of a legend. From the poverty-stricken streets of the South Bronx to the mean streets of Brooklyn, John Gotti's early life would shape him into the man who would become the last mafia icon. As John Gotti grew older, his involvement in street activities paved the way for his rise to power within the notorious Gambino crime family. With his quick wit, street smarts, and unwavering determination, Gotti quickly climbed the ranks of the criminal underworld. In the swinging 60s, John Gotti, the future mafia icon, found love in the arms of Victoria Di Giorgio. Their passionate romance led to marriage in 1962, but their stormy relationship was marred by fights and periods of separation. While Gotti initially dabbled in legitimate work, the allure of the criminal underworld proved irresistible. He turned to a life of crime, leaving behind his attempts at a conventional career. Victoria despised her husband's criminal activities, which often left her strong struggling financially, and even forced her to seek public welfare. Gotti's criminal journey began with petty offenses such as larceny, unlawful entry, and possession of bookmaking records. His first taste of jail time came in 1963, when he was arrested for being in a stolen automobile. But it was in 1966 that Gotti's criminal ambitions took a significant turn. That year, he became associated with a mafia crew led by Carmine Fatico and his brother Daniel. Operating out of the notorious Bergen Hunt and Fish Club, Gotti's criminal career as a hijack 
hijacker took flight, their primary target, the sprawling John F. Kennedy International Airport. Though not the most skilled hijacker, Gotti's criminal activities provided enough success to move his family to a better apartment in Brooklyn. The couple welcomed their fourth child, a son named Frank, into the world. But Gotti's hijacking spree would soon catch up with him. As Gotti's criminal activities escalated, so did his encounters with the law. In November 1967, he and a crew member forged documents and made off with $30,000 worth of merchandise, including women's clothes, from JFK's United Cargo Area. The FBI closely monitored their actions, leading to their arrest just days later. During the subsequent investigation, Gotti was identified as the man who had signed for the stolen merchandise. In February 1968, he was arrested for the United hijacking, but Gotti's criminal spree didn't end there. While out on bail, Gotti found himself in trouble once again. In April, he was arrested for hijacking a load of cigarettes worth nearly $500,000 outside a restaurant on the New Jersey Turnpike. The charges in the cigarette hijacking were eventually dropped, but Gotti's legal battles were far from over. With the guidance of Carmine Fatico, Gotti and his brothers, along with Angelo, hired defense attorney Michael Coiro to represent them. Gotti pleaded guilty to the Northwest hijacking and was sentenced to four years at the Lewisburg Federal Penitentiary in Pennsylvania. His time behind bars was cut short, serving less than three years of his sentence from May 1969 to January 1972. Gotti's release marked a turning point in his life, but the consequences of his criminal past would continue to haunt him. Mafia Man Fatico, a seasoned mobster, had recently beaten two loan sharking cases, but he and his brother Daniel, along with crew members Charles and John Carniglia, had been convicted of hijacking. The Faticos hoped for probation, but their association with known criminals meant that Carmine could no longer hold his position as the capo of the Bergen crew. Gotti saw this as an opportunity to climb the ladder of power. He wanted to take over Fatico's position and become the acting capo of the crew. But before he could do that, Gotti needed to become a made member of the Gambino family. In the first half of 1977, his brother Jean Gotti and Angelo Ruggiero were both made members, paving the way for John's own induction ceremony. The induction ceremony took place later that year, upon Gotti's release from prison. Surrounded by his fellow mobsters, Gotti took the mafia oath of Omerta, solidifying his position within the family. Now as a made member, Gotti's hijacking career officially came to an end. He focused on more traditional mob activities like gambling and loan sharking, using the Bergen crew as his base of operations. Gotti's leadership style was different from his predecessors. He ordered the Bergen crew members to avoid bringing any heat on the club, instructing them to stop loitering in front of the Bergen and to park their cars elsewhere. This was a far cry from the reckless and flamboyant attitude he would later adopt. During the late 1970s and early 1980s, Gotti's gambling habits became a cause for concern among his crew members. He would often lose substantial amounts of money, dropping as much as $30,000 in a single night. While his losses mounted, the crew struggled to make money, but Gotti had a plan to turn their fortunes around. In February 1981, Gotti opened a gambling den on the second floor of the Bergen Club. This exclusive establishment was reserved for family men only, operating every night except Saturday and closing down around 4 a.m. The game was a hit, drawing gamblers from all corners of the city. Finally, the crew began to make money, even as Gotti continued to lose heavily. However, Gotti's concern for those who borrowed money from the house led to a shocking discovery. He ordered an accounting of the debts and was astonished to find that he owed the most, a staggering $55,000. Bugs and taps on the telephone of a crew member revealed the contempt in which others held Gotti, including his own brother Gene and Angelo Ruggiero. As Gotti's gambling empire flourished, his criminal activities caught the attention of law enforcement. One night, a Queens detective squad witnessed a transaction between Wilfred Johnson and a drug dealer. Johnson was caught with $50,000, which he claimed came from the gambling operation. Scared of the consequences, Johnson agreed to become a confidential informant for both the FBI and the New York City Police Department. In June 1981, Johnson's cooperation led to the arrest of approximately 30 men involved in the Mott Street Gambling Club. The men, represented by attorney Michael Coiro, pled guilty to misdemeanor gambling charges and were fined $500. The raid dealt a blow to Gotti's gambling operation, but it was only the beginning of the challenges he would face on his path to becoming the captain of the Gambino family. As information began to surface 
sources from the FBI's confidential informants, a disturbing picture emerged. The notorious Bergen crew, known for their involvement in drug dealing, was at the center of it all. But what role did the infamous John Gotti play in their illicit activities? Outwardly, Gotti maintained the family line of no drugs, but the truth was far more sinister. While it was never explicitly clear how deeply involved Gotti was in the crew's drug operations, there is little doubt that he reaped the benefits of their enormous profits. As the Bergen crew thrived, so did Gotti's own wealth and power. Gotti, a charismatic and cunning figure, skillfully navigated the treacherous world of organized crime. He projected an image of authority and respect, all while secretly profiting from the drug trade that ran rampant within his crew. The allure of easy money and the allure of power proved too tempting to resist. But how did Gotti manage to maintain his facade of innocence? How did he evade the watchful eyes of law enforcement? The answer lies in the intricate web of surveillance that the FBI meticulously wove around him. Enter FBI Special Agent Bruce Mao, a tenacious and determined individual tasked with investigating New York's organized crime families. Mao was chosen to lead what became known as the Gambino Squad, a team dedicated to dismantling the criminal empire that Gotti and his crew had built. With the help of confidential informants, Mao began to unravel the hierarchy of the Gambino crime family. One such informant, codenamed Source Wahoo, provided crucial information that led to the surveillance of Angelo Ruggiero, a key member of the Bergen crew. Ruggiero's involvement in the drug trade was undeniable. His brother Salvatore had become a millionaire through his own drug dealings and was currently a fugitive from justice. This connection made Ruggiero a prime target for the FBI's electronic assault. On November 9, 1981, the FBI placed a tap on Ruggiero's home phone, hoping to capture incriminating conversations related to the drug trade. The agents disguised themselves as construction workers and planted listening devices throughout Ruggiero's residence, even tapping his daughter's bedroom phone. The physical surveillance was also intensified, with agents allowing Ruggiero to spot them in the hopes of provoking further discussions about the drugs. But the real question remained, would Gotti himself be caught discussing the heroin that fueled their empire? The tension mounted as the months passed, and the tape recorders captured a plethora of incriminating evidence pouring out of the mouths of Ruggiero and his visitors. The heroin flowed, and the profits soared, but Gotti remained elusive, careful not to visit the home of a mere soldier. It wasn't until August 8, 1983, 17 months after Salvatore Ruggiero's tragic death, that the Gambino squad made their move. Angelo Ruggiero, Gene Gotti, John Carniglia, Michael Coiro, and Mark Ryder were all arrested. Their voices captured on mountains of tapes, bugs, and phone taps. Tensions were mounting within the Gambino family. Many members were dissatisfied with Castellano's leadership, viewing him as distant and out of touch with the streets. Gotti, fueled by his ambition and dissatisfaction with Castellano, saw an opportunity to make his move. Gotti's fear for his own life and his growing discontent with Castellano's leadership style pushed him to take drastic measures. He believed that his own survival and the future of the Gambino family depended on a change in leadership. Gotti began to devise a plan to eliminate Castellano and seize control of the family. He knew that the assassination of a boss would have far-reaching consequences, but he was willing to take the risk. Guti's charisma and ability to rally support from within the family would prove crucial in executing his plan. Gotti started to gather support from key figures within the Gambino family, including his trusted ally, Agnello Della Croce, the underboss. Della Croce, respected and admired by many, was a powerful force within the family. Gotti knew that he needed Della Croce's backing to successfully carry out his plan. It was a cold winter's night in New York City, December 16, 1985. The bustling streets were filled with unsuspecting New Yorkers going about their daily lives, completely unaware of the impending underworld execution that was about to unfold. This was the night that would forever change the course of the Gambino crime family and solidify John Gotti's rise to power. In the days leading up to the assassination, tensions within the Gambino family were reaching a boiling point. Paul Castellano, the reigning boss, had become increasingly distant from his underlings, leaving them feeling neglected and disappointed respected. It was during this time that John Gotti, a rising star within the family, saw an opportunity to seize control. The group meticulously plotted the assassination of Castellano, knowing that the element of surprise would be their greatest advantage. On that fateful night, Gotti and his associates strategically chose Sparks Steakhouse as the location for the hit. With its bustling crowds and holiday shoppers, they knew the chaos would provide the perfect cover for their nefarious deed. Dressed in long, light-colored trench coats and black fur Russian hats, 
the hitmen blended into the crowd, drawing attention away from their true intentions. Gotti and his trusted lieutenant, Sammy Gravano, positioned themselves nearby, ready to witness the downfall of their boss. As Castellano's car pulled up to the restaurant, the hitmen swiftly moved in, unleashing a hail of bullets. In a matter of seconds, the once powerful boss lay lifeless. His reign abruptly ended. The streets erupted in chaos as the hitmen vanished into the night, leaving behind a scene of shock and disbelief. With the assassination of Paul Castellano, John Gotti had successfully eliminated his biggest obstacle and assumed control of the Gambino crime family. His audacious rise to power sent shockwaves through the criminal underworld and captivated the public's imagination. But little did Gotti know that his reign would be marked by violence, controversy, and a relentless pursuit by law enforcement. The Teflon Don, Gotti, known for his flamboyant style and media-friendly persona, quickly became a powerful figure in the New York City underworld. His charisma and influence allowed him to expand his criminal empire, engaging in a wide range of illicit activities. Extortion, racketeering, and murder became the hallmarks of Gotti's reign. He used his position to extract money from businesses, instilling fear in those who dared to defy him. The Gambino family's grip on the city tightened as Gotti's influence grew. Gotti's involvement in murder was particularly notorious. He ordered the deaths of rival mobsters, suspected informants, and even members of his own family. His ruthlessness knew no bounds, and those who crossed him paid the ultimate price. Despite his involvement in these criminal activities, Gotti seemed untouchable. He earned the nickname the Teflon Don for his ability to avoid conviction in high-profile trials. Time and time again, he walked away from the courtroom a free man, leaving law enforcement frustrated and the public captivated. Gotti's reign also saw the expansion of the Gambino family's operations into drug trafficking. He capitalized on the lucrative trade, further solidifying his control over the New York City underworld. The streets became his domain, and his power seemed unstoppable. Gotti's flamboyant style was on full display as he flaunted his wealth and expensive clothes. He became a symbol of the glamorous yet dangerous world of organized crime, captivating the public's imagination and leaving an indelible mark on popular culture. However, as Gotti's criminal activities continued to escalate, law enforcement agencies intensified their efforts to bring him down. The FBI launched a major investigation into the Gambino family, determined to dismantle Gotti's empire and put an end to his reign of violence. An event took place on September 11, 1984, when Romuald Pysik, a burly refrigerator repairman, found himself caught in a confrontation that would change his life forever. Standing at an imposing six foot two, Pysik was no stranger to the criminal underbelly of his neighborhood. Outside the cozy corner bar in the Maspeth section of Queens, Pysik's car was blocked by a double parked vehicle. Frustrated by the inconvenience, he laid on his horn, demanding the owner of the offending vehicle to appear, and appear he did. The owner of the double-parked car was none other than Frank Coletta, an associate of the notorious Gambino family. In a sudden act of violence, Coletta smacked Pishik across the face, leaving him stunned and disoriented. As Pishik recovered from the blow, a figure emerged from the bar, exuding an air of authority. It was John Gotti, the newly crowned boss of the Gambino family. Without hesitation, Gotti joined the altercation, slapping Pishik across the face once again. Again, the tension escalated as Gotti made a motion to withdraw something from his waistband, a gesture that sent shivers down Pichik's spine. With a menacing warning, Gotti uttered the words that would haunt Pichik for years to come. In the aftermath of the altercation, Pichik wasted no time in seeking justice. He immediately went to the police station to report the incident, determined to hold his attackers accountable. A few days later, Pichik found himself testifying before a grand jury, recounting the events that unfolded outside the cozy corner bar. His testimony would be crucial in bringing Gotti and Coletta to justice. The wheels of justice turned slowly, but eventually, Gotti and Coletta were indicted on charges of felony assault and theft. The stage was set for a high-stakes trial that would captivate the nation. As the trial approached, Gotti's face became a fixture in the newspapers and on television. The notorious murders of Castellano and Bellotti had thrust him into the spotlight, making the outcome of this trial all the more significant. With the trial looming, Pichik found himself living in constant fear for his life. He knew the power and influence of Gotti's men, and the threat he received only intensified his anxiety. To protect himself and his pregnant wife, Pichik took drastic measures. Pichik purchased a handgun, a desperate attempt to ensure his safety in the face of impending danger. He knew that testifying against Gotti could have dire consequences, and he was prepared to defend himself at all costs. A week before the trial was set to begin, a sergeant from the Queens District Attorney's Detective Squad paid a visit to Pichik's home. The purpose of the visit was to discuss the case and ensure Pichik's cooperation, but Pichik's resolve had 
wavered. Fueled by fear, he defiantly declared that he would not testify against Gotti. He knew the consequences of going against the powerful mob boss and his loyal followers. As the trial date approached, tensions ran high. The prosecution, aware of Pichik's fears, requested an anonymous jury to protect him from potential harm. However, their request was denied, setting the stage for a trial that would grip the nation. Just days before the trial was set to begin, Pichik made a surprising statement to a reporter from the New York Daily News. He denied receiving any threats and shockingly declared his intention to testify in Gotti's favor. Finally, the day arrived. The trial of John Gotti and Frank Coletta was about to begin. The courtroom was filled with anticipation as the prosecution and defense prepared to present their cases. But as the trial got underway, a shocking turn of events unfolded. When Pichik was scheduled to take the stand, he was nowhere to be found. Members of the prosecution team searched for him, but he seemed to have vanished into thin air. Late on Thursday, March 20th, Pichik was finally located at Mercy Hospital in Rockville Center, Long Island. It was revealed that he had undergone elective surgery on his right shoulder, a desperate attempt to avoid testifying. Determined to ensure Pichik's appearance in court, detectives from the Queens District Attorney's Office took him into protective custody as a material witness. The stakes were higher than ever as the trial resumed. And so, with dark glasses shielding his eyes and his right arm in a sling, Pichik took the witness stand. The courtroom fell silent as he prepared to testify, his presence a testament to the courage it took to face the powerful John Gotti. But when asked if he could see the men who had assaulted him, Pichik's response sent shockwaves through the courtroom. I do not, Pichik replied. Pressed further, Pichik claimed that the events had faded from his memory. The details were lost to time, leaving only fragments of a violent encounter that had forever altered his life. With Pichik's testimony in shambles, Justice Duffesy declared him a hostile witness. The trial was recessed, and the prosecution's case hung in the balance. In a surprising turn of events, the assault and robbery charges against Gotti and Coletta were ultimately dismissed. The New York Daily News immortalized the trial's outcome with its infamous headline, I For Gotti. Despite John Gotti's ability to evade conviction in the past, his reign of power was destined to come to an end. From 1986 to 1989, the walls began closing in on the Teflon Don as law enforcement agencies intensified their efforts to bring him to justice, imprisonment, and death. Charged with a range of crimes, including murder, racketeering, obstruction of justice, and tax evasion, Gotti's reputation as the Teflon Don would be put to the ultimate test. The trial garnered significant media attention, with the public eagerly following every twist and turn of the proceedings. Gotti, known for his ability to avoid conviction in the past, now found himself in a legal battle that would determine his future. The jury panel, consisting of 12 jurors and four alternatives, was sequestered for three weeks, isolated from the outside world, confined to an undisclosed hotel, their every move was monitored by court guards. They were barred from meeting relatives and friends, and even their telephone conversations were scrutinized. Deliberations were not without their challenges. At one point, an unidentified juror raised concerns about bias, claiming that another juror had formed an opinion on guilt or innocence before the trial even began. Such tensions and clashes of opinion were not uncommon in sequestered juries, and they posed a risk of deadlock and mistrial. After days of deliberation, the jury finally reached a verdict on Friday, February 9, 1990. In a surprising turn of events, Gotti was found not guilty on four assault charges and two conspiracy counts. Jurors who agreed to be interviewed expressed skepticism towards the prosecution's evidence, including the credibility of their star witness, James McElroy. The verdict sent shockwaves through the legal and criminal worlds. Some defense lawyers speculated that the jurors may have been influenced by a subliminal fear of Gotti, a man who appeared to defy authorities with impunity. The three weeks of sequestration may have amplified this fear, leading to a verdict that defied expectations. Despite his previous ability to evade conviction, Gotti's luck had finally run out. The trial marked a significant turning point in his life, as he was ultimately convicted on multiple charges. The Teflon Don was sentenced to life in prison, without the possibility of parole, bringing an end to his reign as the boss of the Gambino crime family. Life Behind Bars presented a new reality for John Gotti, as he navigated the challenges of prison while attempting to maintain control of the Gambino crime family. Despite his incarceration, Gotti's influence continued to loom over the organization through his brother Peter and his son John Jr. Gotti's time in prison was marked by a series of internal power struggles within the family. With their leader behind bars, various factions vied for control, leading to tensions and conflicts. The absence of Gotti's charismatic and authoritative presence left a void that was difficult to fill. While Gotti's son John Jr. initially attempted to step into his father's shoes, he eventually distanced himself from the mafia and pleaded guilty to racketeering charges. This decision further weakened the family's grip on power 
and added to the challenges they faced. The Gambino family also encountered increased scrutiny from law enforcement agencies during this time. Gotti's high-profile trial had put a spotlight on their activities, leading to heightened surveillance and investigations. The family's once formidable reputation was now under threat, with many members facing imprisonment and the organization in disarray. Despite the challenges, Gotti's influence and legacy continued to cast a shadow over the Gambino family. His larger-than-life persona and the impact he had on organized crime were undeniable. However, the era of Gotti's reign marked the beginning of the end for the Cosa Nostra, as law enforcement efforts intensified and the public's perception of organized crime shifted. The year 2002 marked the end of an era for the Gambino crime family with the death of their notorious boss, John Gotti. Gotti's passing had a profound impact on the organization and the criminal underworld as a whole. After years of battling throat cancer, Gotti's health had deteriorated significantly during his time in prison. On June 10, 2002, he succumbed to the disease, bringing an end to his tumultuous life. His death was met with mixed reactions, reflecting the complex legacy he left behind. Gotti's funeral drew significant attention, with hundreds of onlookers gathering to pay their respects. However, notably absent were representatives from the other New York City crime families, highlighting the disarray that had befallen the Gambino family under Gotti's leadership. The void left by Gotti's death further exacerbated the challenges faced by the Gambino family. Internal power struggles intensified as various factions jockeyed for control in the wake of their leader's demise. The absence of Gotti's charismatic and authoritative presence left a power vacuum that was difficult to fill. The impact of Gotti's reign and subsequent death reverberated beyond the Gambino family. His flamboyant style, media presence, and ability to avoid conviction in high-profile trials had captivated the public's imagination. Gotti became a symbol of the mafia, representing both the allure and the dark underbelly of organized crime. In popular culture, Gotti's life and crimes have been the subject of numerous films, TV shows, and songs. Actors such as Armand Asante, John Travolta, and Joseph Ciravo have portrayed him on screen, further perpetuating his legend. While Gotti's death marked the end of his personal journey, his impact on the world of organized crime and the lasting legacy he left behind cannot be denied. The Gambino family, once a powerful force, was left in disarray, with many members imprisoned and the organization struggling to regain its former prominence. The story of John Gotti, the notorious boss of the Gambino crime family, is one filled with shocking events and larger-than-life personalities. From his rise to power through the assassination of Paul Castellano in 1985, to his high-profile trial and eventual conviction in 1992, Gotti's life was a whirlwind of criminal activities and media attention. Gotti's reign as the boss of the Gambino family was marked by illegal activities such as drug trafficking, extortion, and murder. His flamboyant style and outspoken personality earned him the nickname the Dapper Don and made him a prominent figure in organized crime. However, his ability to avoid conviction in high-profile trials came to an end in 1992, when he was found guilty on multiple charges. Life in prison presented new challenges for Gotti, as he attempted to maintain control of the Gambino family through his brother Peter and his son John Jr. However, internal power struggles and increased law enforcement scrutiny weakened the family's grip on power. Gotti's death in 2002 marked the end of an era for the Gambino family. His passing left a void that was difficult to fill, and the organization faced further challenges and disarray. The impact of Gotti's reign and his larger-than-life persona continue to captivate the public's imagination, as his life and crimes have been the subject of numerous films, TV shows, and songs. The story of John Gotti serves as a reminder of the sensational and shocking nature of organized crime. It highlights the rise and fall of a charismatic and powerful figure who left an indelible mark on the world of organized crime. While his reign may have marked the beginning of the end for the Cosa Nostra, the legacy of John Gotti continues to intrigue and fascinate to this day. Thank you for joining us on this captivating journey through a day in the life of John Gotti. Click on the card showing on your screen if you enjoyed this video. See you there.